Let's do this. It's time for Hanging with Langan. I like that she's got a big, dirty mouth that gets her in trouble. Wow. Stop me, cause I'm having a good time. Hey, thanks for hanging with Langan. I'm Maureen Langan, and this is my little chat show where I, I talk with cool people from academics to alcoholics and everyone in between. You can be both. You can be an alcoholic and an academic. I don't judge people. You're all welcome. You know the routine here. I want you, if you're watching on the Hanging with Langan group page, make sure that you give us permission to see your name. Should you have a comment? We can see your comments, but we want to see your beautiful name. StreamYard.com forward slash Facebook, click on the blue button. If you're like, geez, I'm in such a hurry. I got to run now. I want to see the whole thing. Uh, fret not. All of this is available on all the major podcast platforms. Just go to MaureenLangan.com. Go to the podcast page. You can click wherever you follow your podcast, Apple, Spotify. And the video always lives on Patreon.com, Maureen Langan. So there we have it. You know, uh, other things went on at the Academy Awards aside from face slapping. Other things happened. Amy Schumer, I don't know if anybody noticed, but she was a host and Wanda Sykes. Things were happening that people may have forgotten. Coda won Best Picture. I have not yet seen it. I cannot wait to see it. People said it's riveting. It's the story of a young gal being raised by two deaf parents. So what I wanted to do is invite a guest on today similar situation, the same situation. She has a book called Burn Down the Ground. She is the founder, the creator, the do-it-aller of a place called QED in Astoria. It's a performance space, comedy classes, stand-up comedy, dance, art, a cafe. She does it all. I want her here right now to talk about her book and her life's experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Hanging with Langan stage, uh, Cambry Cruz. <laughs> Cambry. <laughs> when your book first came out, it's the 10th year anniversary. It is, yeah, almost to the day. February 28th, I think, was um, the 10 year anniversary of it coming out, which is remarkable to me. Uh. I had you on my radio show in San Francisco at the time. The book was, it was just riveting. I want you to talk, give people a synopsis about your childhood and your life. Uh, well, the elevator pitch uh, is yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm a hearing child of two deaf parents, and uh, we lived in the woods without running water, electricity, or indoor plumbing, and we got a trailer that was repossessed. My dad tried to kill my mother, and then he served 20 years in prison for trying to kill another woman. Oh, so, boy. Yeah, oh, naturally, boy. I got into comedy. <laughs> that is. Were you an only child, or did you have siblings? I have an older brother. He's um, pretty severely mentally ill, and so, uh, and also, he's about four and a half years older than me. So, just enough to where he was kind of out of the house uh, when some of the more serious things went down. Where did you grow up? In Texas, in South mm -hmm. Texas, and then in high school, went to. Uh, we moved to the big city, Dallas, Fort Worth. So. Uh, you know, I did read the book and about your dad going to jail. Just even if you had hearing parents, all of this is so traumatic. No matter. Yeah, I know. Um, whenever I was writing the book, part of me felt like it was just too much. It's like, how could this all happen to one person? You know, I could write just a book about being a coda, you know, a child of deaf adults. And now with the movie and coda, you, you can see that that is a story in and of itself. Um, just a glimpse into the the community and the life of um, what bridging two cultures and, and all that is like. Um, but but uh, yeah, aside from being a CODA, then also just living off the grid the way we did in such a, a wild, um, uh, like just a wild childhood, just tumultuous childhood. And then on top of all of that, the domestic violence and um, the relationship with my dad and how that changed once he um, once he committed his second attempted murder. It, how did it change then? Uh, well, when he went to prison for the uh, he when he attacked my mom, he did not serve any jail time. Um, and so for 
about, I think it was like 13 years of, uh, after, it was almost like the world was gaslighting me. Like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Or, or maybe I was over exaggerating. Maybe I didn't think, maybe it wasn't as serious of a crime. Maybe it was just a thing that happens between families and this is normal, you know? You don't try to kill each other. Yeah, that's, that's well, what they Well, just the domestic violence, like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, what happens behind a family's closed doors is their business. If you don't, and uh, domestic violence laws were a lot different then. Um, this was 1988, 1989, 88. Um, and so a couple of years before Nicole Brown Simpson's murder, which mm -hmm. really brought domestic violence into the forefront and the Violence Against Women Act was passed after all that. And so it was a, a different time. But then um, 13 years later, my dad tries to kill this other woman and it really brought it all into focus again. Like my memories and my PTSD got a sniff of smelling salts, you know, it was like all uh -huh. reawakened. And it really, um, well, the way I likened it is that um, after the first attack, you know, I just kind of went on with life. I didn't have therapy and-, and Can it, I ask it, how he tried to attack these women and kill these women? Did he have one method or did he have, did he mix it up? What was well, he, how did he try to kill your mother? Uh, well, yes, I guess he would. Yes, you could say he had an M.O. He was uh, knife, knives and choking. You know, so okay. very, right. very, very intimate. forte. All right. Yeah. But um, I used to liken the whole situation to having uh, broken my arm, let's say. And so my arm healed, but it wasn't properly set. And so when this attack happened, it's like you're, re you're resetting and you're re-breaking this wound so that it can heal properly. So... Yeah. In this uh, future, uh, the 13 years later, it was definitely, it changed my relationship with my dad in, in that I, he was now in prison where mm -hmm. I knew he wouldn't hurt anyone, mm -hmm. sober. And we could talk about like, how, how did this happen to him? Like, why is he like this? I have plenty of deaf family and deaf friends, and he's the only one who's violent like this. So mm -hmm. this isn't a deaf thing. This isn't a culture thing. And d domestic violence knows no socioeconomic boundaries. You know, it doesn't live within com confines of different, uh, it, it's, it can affect anyone. You know? Right. He could be fully hearing and have done all those things. It right. has nothing to do with his hurdles as a deaf man. Right. But you said you have deaf family. Was it beyond your parents? Well, yes. And I will back and say no, his particular problems do have a stuff, have a lot to do with him being deaf. He, oh hated, hated being deaf. Whereas my, my grandparents on my mom's side, they were generationally deaf and they were all very proud to be deaf, loved being deaf, were pillars in their deaf community. They were on the boards and they were president of the deaf clubs and associations. They were in the newspaper for all the different community events they did. They were upstanding citizens and, um, and their deafness was uh, just um, a part of who they were and not anything else. Whereas with my dad, it very much was something he resented. He had been abused as a child, uh, at, uh, partly because of his deafness, and um, th which is not unusual in a lot of uh, situations, unfortunately. You know, but his parents were not deaf. Right, right, yeah. Nor were most of his siblings. Three other siblings of his were deaf and yeah, there were 10 kids. Sorry? He had 10, there were 10 kids and he was one of 10 and four of the 10 were deaf. There had to be some genetic component there, don't you think? If three, no. there no. wasn't. No, 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents and 90% of deaf parents have hearing children. So generational deafness is actually quite rare, that whole genetic generational deafness thing. So that was just the luck of the draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, and he had a twin brother who was not deaf, and that was a big source of anger and resentment because there were only two sons, and he was the one son that was deaf, and yeah. It's interesting that once he went to jail, your relationship got better because you could feel safe that he was behind bars. Right. I thought it would maybe take a turn the other way. Well, initially, yeah. Initially, I was like, he he might as well have been dead to me. And it was right after 9-11, and I remember having really um, 
I, I my office overlooked Fifth Avenue and St. Mm -hmm. Patrick's Cathedral and um, all the funerals uh, for the fallen firemen and, and police officers and stuff. It was just day in and day out of these terrible, terrible funerals with the, the bagpipes wailing. It was so, so deeply depressing. Mm -hmm. And I would, I remember thinking, God, I wish, I wish my dad had just died on 9-11. Wow. It would have been so much easier for him to actually be dead. But then also, if he had died in this terrible tragedy, people wouldn't know about all the bad things he'd done. You know, they would just be like, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. And they would want to know all the great things about him. Yeah, a, a hero. He'd be a yeah. hero. Yeah, yeah. I wonder why your parents chose. Well, what did your father do for a living? He was a construction worker. Um, he honestly, he... Uh, it was a prodigy in a lot of ways when it comes to construction and engineering and architecture and things like that. Um, he was a foreman on a lot of um, uh, of his construction projects, which, mm -hmm. you know, to be a deaf man uh, and a foreman in the 70s before the Americans with Disabilities Act and everything, I really think yeah. it is a testament to his his skill. I want to reintroduce the topic. If you're just tuning in, my guest is Cambry Cruz. She, in you know, the movie Coda just highlighted a child of two deaf parents. She had the same experiences. I don't think as many happy moments. Maybe I didn't see the film, but I heard it's yeah. very happy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that's yeah. I don't. Uh, I definitely don't want to um, make it seem like I had a miserable childhood. It's so far, that's how it seems, Cambry. So yeah. far. <laughs> Living in the woods, no electricity, running water. My mother came to America, so I would not have to live like that. Right, yeah. She grew up on a 10 like that on a farm. So I want to know, paint the picture for me as a young girl growing up. Your parents seem, do they purposely isolate by living in the woods in a, in a mobile home? Yeah. yeah, it was definitely a purposeful isolation. My dad was uh, definitely a little bit of a scoundrel cheating on my mom and stuff. And um, getting off the grid was a way to keep him a little further away from the bars and the, and the bad uh, elements oh. of, of city so, life. Yeah. So he wasn't isolating because he was deaf. He was isolating because he was. Oh, uh, yeah. He was a ladies man. Oh no. And he would, he would cheat on my mom with hearing women. Hearing women would learn sign language to be with him. He was very charismatic, extremely smart. Um, uh, like I said, he was basically a prodigy uh, and he has um, his IQ is a genius IQ. And uh, hmm. uh, yeah, he, he definitely had um, a fan base. <laughs> He yeah, he was really good looking too. That didn't hurt. <laughs> well, what I wanted to talk, oh, her book, Cambry's book is called Burn Down the Ground. It's available on Amazon, Burn Down the Ground. I read it, you guys. It's riveting, riveting. And I know you lost your father since the writing of that book and rest his During soul. the pandemic, yeah, during mm -hmm. the pandemic. And yeah. But, you know, and with the, the CODA movie, a couple of my friends were like, oh, uh, this your book should be a movie. And I'm like, you know, if, if there's possibility that it would, it's been optioned a few times and there's always the possibility that it could be turned into a movie or TV show or whatever. Um, but uh, they're like, oh, it's, they, they seem like um, they might be, sad that it might not ever make it to that stage. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, honestly, I'm so grateful for the book having been published in the first place and to have become a bestseller is uh, beyond my imagination. It afforded me so many great opportunities. Um, QED is a direct result of the book uh, that, you know, I was able to to open QED as a result of that. And we're going to get to that in a bit. QED is the performance space that Cambry opened in Astoria mm -hmm. in Queens. Yeah. And it's, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But what I wanted to talk to you about is being a child, being isolated in many ways, not having hearing parents, being in the middle of the woods in Texas. What, tell me what your day in day life experience was for you growing up with deaf parents. Were you resentful or was this normal? Did you grow up when a child made, how did you learn to speak well? Because deaf parents don't have the same sounds that hearing parents have. That would be fair to say. So how did you as a little girl formulate your words, learn your language? And did you learn um, 
sign language simultaneously with speaking language? Well, um, my first word was daddy in sign language. When I was six months old, I was uh, assigning. And by the time I was 16 months old, I was already signing in, in, and speaking in both languages pretty fluently to the point where I got a scar on my head because a, a little accident at home where I tripped and, and busted my head open. And the doctors and nurses were like, uh, she's not 16 months old. Like uh, she's singing and sign language and telling us these stories. And it's just that... Um, Growing up with sign language and the dual languages, it des definitely improves your English skills. And I know the whole baby sign language is a bit of a, a trend that parents kind of mm -hmm. latch onto for that reason. Um, but you know, there's television and radio. I, I'm I'm not deaf, so I learned how to talk because I'm not deaf. <laughs> oh, I know that. I just meant as a baby, they start to make sounds and they start yeah, to go yeah. mum, mum, mum. And so I'm just yeah. wondering, Yes, you could watch television, but you could be, you know, saying words that like. Yeah, my brother was uh, raised mostly by my uh, grandmother, my mom's mom. My mom went back to work right uh, right away when my brother was born, and so in the, they didn't they had television, but um, uh, he learned how to speak a little slower than I did as a result because my deaf grandmother was not as verbal as my mom, and my mom can speak pretty clearly. So clearly okay. that that you can't even tell that she's deaf. So really, um, okay. the, the, it was honestly, it's just like growing up in any household where it's uh, English is a second language. It's no different than that. And so sometimes, sometimes when people uh, meet me and they think that they can't really relate to the idea of having a deaf family, it's, a, a, it's like, well, no, if your parents are first generation immigrants, you can relate to this because um, you're bridging two cultures. You're trying to explain to your parents why something is funny here in America and they're not making fun of you. This is just the way it is over here, that kind of thing. And interpreting. That's a really good way. I getting, like how you just said it, the analogy of it's English as a second language, no different than if somebody were speaking Italian at home. Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, bridging two cultures. And, you know, of course, each culture has their own quirks and their own funny little uh, jokes and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's no different than that. Just being caught in an interpreting situations. Now with the Americans with Disabilities and, and the, uh, the activism for interpreters, licensed interpreters being required in places, it's helped a lot of kids get out of situations that I found myself stuck in where I was interpreting bill collector calls and um, doctor's mm -hmm. appointments with my grandmother and things like that. That said, uh, when I was 16 and my whole world fell apart because my dad attacked my mom, I was fully capable of going out into the world and opening up a bank account because I'd done it already. I'd been making airline flights for myself since I was five years old. I used to call airlines and book flights for myself, get on a flight alone without a guardian, fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma, get off the flight and meet my deaf grandparents and spend the summer with them and then make a flight home and when I was five. And I've got little pictures of me with my little Barbie suitcase thing and yeah, it's fun. Cambry, cute, cute, so cute. Um, Cambry, though, did your mother have some hearing ability if she was able to? she was to born, yeah. You know, when she was born, she was born hard of hearing, and then she gradually went deaf. But her sister and her parents were both uh, fully deaf. Huh. So she had been at an age where she was able to formulate her speech. Yes, yeah, she's we uh, definitely, she, even though she's now deaf, she's also a CODA. So she had that same life experience that CODAs can uh, uh, understand of, of trying to be there for your parents. She ended up not going to college because her dad wanted her to stay home and interpret for them and be there for them. And oh, wow. didn't think college wow. was necessary. Then, you know, and that's a generational difference for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. She was born in 47 and, you know, closed captioning. We didn't have closed captioning until I was well into high school. Um, what do you think about those deaf frauds? They would go on and pretend that they were signing. And some of these, you know, they did that. It happened like, once. Yeah. At, um, well, I think it happened twice. I think I remember a second time it happening. I'm thinking, how does that? Get, well, get thankfully, in? it's only happened once or twice. <laughs> I mean. It's I insane that they could get up there and nobody noticed. I mean, you would notice. Well, no, people did notice. And that's why they were caught. I mean, it's it's it, it really highlights uh, because those happened, I believe one was in South Africa. Yeah, oh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, yeah, it really yeah. highlights uh, the lack of 
um, care that goes into uh, interpreting in other countries. I mean, America still has a long way to go in, in the way that we handle it. But at least there are like when I go to an event, a licensed interpreter is required to be there. But then if the event is longer than 30 minutes, they have to have it two so they can switch off because it's exhausting um, uh, signing for that long of a time period. So to have breaks in between and stuff. And uh, yeah, it just goes to show and highlight the inadequacies in other countries. And you know what, too, um, you would think they would we have to audition or send a tape or something when we're going to host an event, or you would think that they would vet these people. But anyway, it's yeah, just it you the lack of care that goes into it. And now, and now imagine you're a deaf person and you need help at the doctors. And this is the kind of care that is going into it. Yeah. You're, you're screwed. Can I ask you a, an ignorant question? Because this is part to learn, right? Misconceptions. I mean, just even that analogy again of saying it's like English is a second language is so wonderful because it puts it into a great perspective. I grew up with kids who were interpreting their parents uh, at the parent teacher conference. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why when they say, if, if you want to come to America, you should know how to speak English first. I'm like, really? Okay. All right. Some people have said that. I'm thinking, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can Deaf people drive. Of course. <laughs> well, I don't know because you have to hear this. I know, but see, I don't want to say of course because I don't know. Yeah. Yes. See, I would just think with horns. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Is that, well, there's, it was uh, there's not even a designation on the uh, driver's license. But I mean, honestly, it's no more distracting than having your radio on too loud where you can't hear or text. Things. Yeah. Text. Um, and I will say also just uh, the heightened awareness of what's going on around you is certainly an added bonus, you know, to notice lights and, and signals and things. Yeah. You don't mind that I asked that I had to know. How would I know if I didn't ask? Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's a stupid question. Sometimes that's how you learn. And then you just said they have a right. heightened awareness. So they're probably better drivers than people with music blasting. And yeah. Text. Unless yeah. you have a deaf person with them. Well, they wouldn't have the music blasting, but texting that, I don't think that would be good. I wouldn't be. Oh my God. Text. I can, I can always tell when I'm around a driver who's texting and it's, it's so frightening. It's mind boggling, mind boggling. Cambry Chris is my guest and her book is called Burn Down the Ground, available at Amazon. A really fascinating story, not just about growing up with parents who were deaf, but growing up with a father who tried to kill a couple of women, went to jail, you know, things like that. Just a little yeah. bit of that. Domestic violence is something that's not talked about, for in, um, in, in, especially in isolated communities. I think it's really important that we uh, make it part of the discussion of just, um, it, it's, I think in since the 10 years of my book coming out, people have gotten so much better about talking about mental health issues, uh, mm -hmm. violence in, in the house and things like that. And, and I think through discussion comes healing and change. And I certainly learned a whole lot about the prison system and what reforms are needed. And um, and it, it, it the, the whole system is designed for recidivism, really. And if anybody can make it out of prison and make something better of their lives after they get out, it's honestly, it's a miracle to me. And the book is also about your journey too. I mean, what independence you had. I, the book is very honest. You're very honest. I want everybody to get it on Amazon, burn down the ground. Before we let you go though, of course, we have to talk about what you created for yourself in Astoria. I just got to do my own little commercial break here. Everybody waits for this. Uh, hang it with Langan. Follow me on MaureenLangan.com and the podcast page is there. You can get your Don't Make Me Hate You material, uh, whatever you want. Do you want a t-shirt? Would you like a onesie? How about some coasters, a, a phone case, a clock? Just go there. It's DontMakeMeHateYou.com. Everything's at MaureenLangan.com. And my special is out. It's my dry bar comedy special, Don't Make Me Hate You. Again, MaureenLangan.com, the source of everything. Also... I will be taking Don't Make Me Hate You to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Oh, oh no kidding. Yeah, that'll be fun. Oh, that'll be fun. 
Oh, and I just that's great. want to let other pe people know that you can subscribe to Patreon beginning at five bucks a month. What's Patreon, Maureen? It's a way you support the arts, the artists. As simple as five bucks a month, you'll get all the videos there because that's where they live. I have so many great people up there. Five bucks with uh, with Carol. Go up to twenty five with Phyllis. You get a T shirt at the twenty five dollar level because I'm all about love. I, I don't want to hate people. They make me. Hate don't them. make me hate you. I do. I'm a victim. See the T-shirt over my shoulder? There we go. Here, let me do full screen. Stand by. Me, Kevin. There we go. Yeah. T-shirt sign that says, uh, he who laughs last thinks slowest. Not for sale. <laughs> and the um, color of your wall actually is the color of the walls at upstairs at QED. I'm in the basement at QED right now. So well, I will be there in a couple of weeks to check it out with Liz Glazer, who's doing a show there, and she's a talented woman. So we want to give a shout out to my to my best friend. I've met her once and I fell in love with her. <laughs> she's <laughs> more than not fall in love with. She's great. Yeah. And I'm working with her at the Emmeline Theater in Mamaroneck, New York this weekend, folks. Hi. Another thing I was gonna say, um, just follow me at MaureenLangan.com. There it goes. That's my commercial break. Very excited about your Edinburgh trip. I wish that if I did not have QED, I could maybe write another book. And I had had uh, done a one person show of Burn Down the Ground, a solo show that I thought would be really great in Edinburgh. I mean, the sign language element of my story it, it almost begs for a visual version of it, you know, like oh. a movie or TV or a staged version of it. Um, but yeah, with QED, it's like, I, I told you offline, it's like the best worst thing I've ever done to myself. It's this beautiful little community art space. Um, everyone from uh, Al Franken just did an hour here and all the Saturday Night Live cast and crew have been here uh, over the years. And uh, and then Jim Gaffigan and he, Jim Gaffigan actually did an episode of his sitcom based on QED. And, and I, it's just like a really neat little place. And then right now what's happening upstairs is like a little open mic where there's some people up there who've never stepped foot on a stage ever in their life. And then everyone in between. So what a beautiful little place where really it's by and for creative people, artists of all types and all ages, women come here by themselves, which to me is a good indicator of a great safe place, you know, where you're you're feeling welcome. And um, yeah, it's a good thing, but it's like an albatross around my neck. I can't leave the place. And if I try to leave it, <laughs> I get a text that the, the toilet's broken. You know, something bad is always, uh, always around the corner. Like if I'm having too much fun here, I, I can guarantee you something bad will happen within 24 no, hours. No, no, Just no, like no. people are saying, no, 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 you can't have fun here. Remember, this is work. <laughs> you have to want this. And QED is in Astoria, and it's a performance space. So it's all the arts. It's not just stand-up, yeah. though there's stand-up nights. It, it's performance, music, art. Do you have a cafe, too? Um, we have a little bar, like a concession stand is how I like to refer to it because I don't, you know, you've been to a million bars and restaurants that have a back room where they happen to throw on a show. Well, we've got a theater and we just happen to have a bar. So. And what does QED stand for? It is quad erat demonstrandum, Latin for that which can be demonstrated. Uh, if you're a math nerd or you do crossword puzzles, if you do crossword puzzles, you, you've seen it as a clue. Um, but if uh, in geometry, after you've solved a proof at the very end, you would have to write QED and say it like, see above, I've shown my work. And here oh. on stage, we're showing our work. And it's not just comedy, it's lectures and, and talks and readings and things like that. And plus being in Queens, I figured people might think it meant Queens Ed. So I liked that double entendre there. Oh, very good. I don't know about the math thing because that's what math made me study English because I was like, <laughs> I don't know all of this. Uh, also, we have to give a shout out that she is married to the gifted and talented. Christian Finnegan. I think I have a poster on the wall somewhere. There he is from his uh, Au Contraire album. Uh, well, he's a very talented man, so I wanted to give a shout out to him too. Please get Cambry's book called Burn Down the Ground on Amazon. If you're in the New York area, 
get your ass over to QEDAstoria.com, see what she's created. Before I let you go, I have to ask, how accurate did you think the movie Coda was to the uh, deaf community? Pretty accurate. It's it's one of those things where, you know, if you're a comedian and they do a show about comedy, you can kind of see through some of the mm -hmm. hacky kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I found it to be really spot on. Um, I know I, I saw actually yesterday or the day before a kind of critical uh, take on it by a deaf person um, talking about how hypersexualized her parents seem to be or whatever. And I was like, well, I don't know. That was my experience. My parents were very touchy feely and had sex every Saturday morning. The Smurfs were interrupted. Like I cannot hear the Smurfs jingle and not think <laughs> terrible, of terrible imagery. <laughs> <laughs> like the Smurfs have suddenly turned into softcore porn for me. Oh um, my yeah, God. Every Saturday morning. And so it's like, you know, that that's one experience versus another. But also if you're a deaf person, you're having it from the, the you're experiencing this from your point of view. Whereas like as a coda, I can tell you a lot of codas have heard a little too much than they should. <laughs> Very good. Well, fortunately for me, we were all immaculately conceived. I heard that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, Cambry, um, hang back in, in, in the back room for a moment. Okay. Uh, Cambry Cruz, you guys, QEDAstoria.com. And she's also, uh, her book, you got to get her book. I read it. I had her on my show when it first came out when I was in San Francisco on the radio. Please know that if you want to hire me to host your corporate events, you moderate your CEO panel, give a ring. It doesn't always have to be stand up. You know, I was the journalist for a long time there. So we bring the right tone. We could do a talk, a TED talk. I can, uh, you know, uh, make it fit for your organization. Follow me at MaureenLangan.com. You'll see where I'm performing next. Love for you to come out. Always just shoot an email at, you know, go to MaureenLangan.com. Send me an email. Let me know who or what you'd like to see on the show. Uh, but you know the routine. Until we meet again. Bye, wig. No, no, you cannot leave me like that. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. And feel free to share it with a friend. Please don't go, please. I'll be back. Au revoir.